This week on the show, the United States Postal Service slams on the brakes on a couple of issues while Mercari does a complete U-turn. What is up, Galaxians? Welcome to episode number 247 of the Galaxy CD's Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. My name is Ryan. If you're new here, I am a full-time reseller, part-time YouTuber, and podcaster working out of my home here in the greater Cincinnati area. And this channel is all about the flip life. We're going to cover uh, quite a bit of reselling news this week. Some of it you, I'm sure, have already heard. There was big news dropped by Mercari on Wednesday that we're going to go over in a little bit of depth here today. But most of you have probably already heard unless you've been living under a rock. <laughs> uh, if you follow any reseller on Instagram or on YouTube, we've all of us have already been talking about this, but we'll cover it anyway. Uh, a couple of updates from the Postal Service, which I think um, actually all of them are really good news for resellers for a change and uh, widely for a lot of folks just generally. Uh, we'll also have another update from eBay on something they're working on from brands and an update from Etsy in addition to, of course, the What Sold recap at the back end of the show. As always, I will, I, I say as always, as has been for the last month. <laughs> uh, I'll put some timestamps down in the video description below, so if you want to get to a particular portion of the show, you can go straight to it. That out of the way, let's get into this reselling news. News updates. Mercari. Uh, reinstating our prior returns policy. Now I do that, I do the applause and by and large, this is going to be perceived as a win for sellers. I'll get into in a minute here why I'm not completely convinced uh, that it's totally a win for Mercari, but uh, the three day window to return inaccurately described items is how they describe this. We recently announced a quote, returns for any reason, unquote policy in an effort to make it e even easier to buy and sell on Mercari. After careful consideration and listening intently to feedback from our seller community, we have decided to reinstate our prior return policy effective May 22nd, 2024 at 12 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Returns for any reason will no longer apply. Starting May 22nd, 2024, at 12 a.m., buyers will have a three-day period to return inaccurately described items. This allows some for some flexibility for buyers while respecting sellers' time and effort in listing, packaging, and mailing items. We remain committed to piloting policies that benefit our entire community and will continue to act swiftly to adapt when needed. Note, if you're using the Macari app on iOS or Android, you may need to update the app if it doesn't automatically update on your device. Thank you for helping us make Mercari the best marketplace to shop and sell. They have posted this on their terms of service update to return policy effective 522. It essentially reiterates the same thing, but goes into a lot more depth about what the actual policy is that uh, essentially they still have 72 hours, which is what they have always had to from the time a delivery scan is received by Mercari to request a return. The return eligibility criteria is what is changing back to the original criteria. The item is not as described in the listing. The item doesn't work as described. The item was damaged during shipping. They, a customer did not receive everything that they ordered. They received the totally wrong item or they have authenticity concerns. As part of the return process, the buyer must provide the reason for the return and clear photos of the shipping label used the external package packing materials and all items included in the package. So the buyers are going to have to jump through some hoops to do these returns. Buyers must provide the requested information within 24 hours of the request. In some cases, Mercari may sh share the buyer's photos with the seller or require additional information. Snap a photo of the item all packaged up before and after taping the box. So there's a tip. If you're a seller on Mercari, they're suggesting that you take a picture of every item you ship. <laughs> uh, let me know in the comments what you think of that. Um, process. I do that with electronics. I will take, uh, generally I've got all those in my listing photos anyway, but I'll take like a picture of the serial number or something like that to make sure that in the case of a return that I can be assured that I'm going to get the same item back. Uh, but let me know in the comments what you think of that bit of advice. 
Mercari, they go on, has the right to refuse a return request, including in cases of fraudulent conduct or where the item has been modified after receipt. For new items that are sealed or wrapped by the original manufacturer, these may not be returned if they have been unsealed or unwrapped by the buyer. So if you ship something new in package and the customer opens it, they're saying it cannot be returned unless the item does not work, it's damaged, or it is not authentic. Undergarments, bathing suits, and beauty products may only be returned in their original packing and may not be tried on. So clothing sellers and uh, beauty product sellers who were two of the biggest categories of sellers that were really up in arms over the change in the return policy that happened about six weeks ago, your uh, situations have been addressed. Uh, when a return is approved, they could continue. They will provide a free shipping label to the buyer. The buyer has three calendar days to provide the item to the designated shipping carrier and seven days for the acceptance scan to allow for weekend and holiday drop-off or the return may be voided. So they're under a lot more time pressure than what eBay does for return shipments, which is good. If the return item was shipped and confirmed by the carrier but is not received by the seller, the buyer will be refunded no later than 15 calendar days from the first carrier scan date. If the buyer does not use the return label provided by Mercari in the required time frame, then the order will be rated and a refund will not be issued. So there you go. Um, good news for most sellers. I think most people will take this as a win. The area where I get concerned is that Mercari has, in essence, caved to uh, the seller's requests, to sellers leaving the platform. They have... I can't say this with any certainty. I'm not in their boardroom. <laughs> uh, but it appears that they have panicked about the number of sellers that are leaving. Remember, they made all these changes. They got rid of the selling fees. And they did all of this in order to attract more sellers. And the feedback widely has been that sellers are not listing and or are leaving the platform altogether, in particular because of this return policy change. So after all the, the squawking and the commotion, Macari is essentially just flipped back. They've, as I said in the in the title, they've returned their return policy and gone back to the original one. My concern is really not so much with going back to that policy. I think that policy was probably fine to begin with. The problem is to me that it shows a lack of good decision making, competence, leadership in maybe the C-suite level over at Macari. I don't know how any organization that's involved with resellers could have come to the decision that their new return policy that they're now going to be getting rid of was a good idea. <laughs> uh, for me, it was a complete misreading of the room. If you talked to many resellers at all, you knew that returns were a big, big issue for most resellers. And I know Mercari likes to fancy themselves as the site where the average user of their site is buying and selling things. But the reality is that most of the items that are on their site that are being sold on a daily basis are things that are posted by people like you and me. Professional, semi-professional, full-time, part-time resellers. We're in this to make some money. We're not just trying to get rid of an item like we would at a garage sale. This is a profit center for us. And despite them not wanting that to be the case, that is the situation, and sellers who are in that situation were not interested in this return policy at all. The other thing that concerns me is obviously the just the flip-flop back to this. There's no, again, I don't want to be too critical. There's no apparent creativity or nuance to this. They haven't attempted to, in any way, as near as I can tell, split the baby, as it were, and come up with some kind of compromise solution that would satisfy both sellers in those categories, buyers who one of the pillars of the, the movement of the fees from sellers to buyers was that they were opening up the returns allowance for buyers. Now they've done away with one of those one of those legs of that stool that they built that whole proposition on. And that makes me a little nervous also about how long that proposition might continue. So there's no I'll, I'll compare this to what Amazon just did. So we've talked about this a couple times on this show. Amazon introduced the low inventory fee for FBA sellers. So if your inventory of an item fell below a certain threshold, you were going to be charged what amounted to a penalty fee for being under a certain number of days worth of stock on hand. 
and sellers rightly were concerned about that. What they did, what Amazon did, was they allowed, initially it was a one-month window, which they ultimately expanded to a 45-day window to trial this, and then they adapted the program in a way that addressed most of the seller's concerns, which the big concern was closeout product, end-of-life product, seasonal product, which at some points throughout the lifespan of that item are naturally going to fall below a certain level. I still want to get rid of them all. I still got them. I still got to sell them. But once it reaches a certain threshold and I can't buy anymore, I can't get back up above whatever that minimum level was. And Amazon came up with a way to address that while keeping, by and large, the policy intact. So that what they have done is essentially satisfied most everyone. They have made it a more palatable policy for sellers while leaving in place the proposition that they wanted to achieve, which was to be able to have more inventory on hand, theoretically in more locations, so they could deliver more products to more customers more quickly than ever before. And that clearly, as we talked about last week in their quarterly reports, is working out very, very well <laughs> for them. Uh, it's been fantastic. So they found a way creatively to solve the issue, to take care of sellers and to take care of themselves. I don't feel like, and you can let me know in the comments below, I don't feel like Mercari has done that in this case. They just threw up their hands and went back to the original policy which again, to be fair, I didn't think anything was wrong with that policy to begin with. But once you've changed that, and then six weeks later, caved to pressure, what's the next thing that changes? Buyers are obviously already squawking about having to pay fees to buy on Mercari. Will they bow to that pressure and then come back on sellers and say, you know what, this was a mistake. We're going to move the fees back to sellers at which point sellers will be upset because many sellers have changed their pricing already. They've gone through all the motions and done all the things to accommodate this change in the policy. And now it comes back on them and they start squawking. Where does Macari go? What do they do next when they have an issue like this? So again, let me know in the comments what you think about this. I think Mercari has potentially opened a Pandora's box of actions, reactions, and overreactions that may come to haunt them uh, down the road. So short term, this is a win, obviously, for sellers, particularly in those categories that are ripe for fraud and rent to wear and all the rest of that. But by and large, I think this whole process does not reflect well on Mercari. Anyway, moving on to the Postal Service, they made some announcements uh, last week, which will be terrific for hopefully for service and for anybody who ships or mails anything. Uh, this article appeared over on Yahoo Finance. It was originally from Reuters. The United States Postal Service will delay processing network consolidation plans. We've talked about this over the last several months. Part of the Louis DeJoy's plan is to consolidate processing centers so that there are less of them and they are more efficient. The problem, of course, has been that the efficiencies have not been there while the closures have been there and there are mail delays and lost mail and there are delivery issues pretty much across the country at this point. Congress, as I had talked about a couple of weeks ago, had sent a letter to um, Postmaster DeJoy and he has agreed to pause planned further consolidation of the Postal Service's processing network after a bipartisan group of senators raised concerns about the impact on mail deliveries. In a letter to Senator Gary Peters, which was made public last Monday, DeJoy said he would pause the consolidation of processing facility operations until at least January of 2025. So the rest of this year, whatever seven months is left, there will be no more consolidation. What they're going to attempt to do is to consolidate the, the work that's being done at the ones that have already been consolidated to get to the efficiencies and the performance levels that they need to to be able to deliver the mail to you and I on time. So I, I'm not a fan, <laughs> uh, as has probably been made clear here over the many months we've been talking about this, uh, but credit to him for recognizing that the pressure was being brought to bear and that there are delivery issues within their network that they need to fix, and he's going to attempt to do so. DeJoy said the change would delay USPS cost savings, 
between 133 to 177 million dollars. So of course he's crying that this is going to cost them money. Peter said he would keep pushing DeJoy and the USPS Board of Governors, quote, for a plan that won't interfere with med- critical mail service. The issue is, DeJoy has said all along, this is going to make mail delivery more efficient. And the fact is that it has not, to this point, done so. Now, Rome wasn't built in a day. These are big changes. They are going to take some time to implement. But I think this pause of the breakneck speed at which they were trying to implement all those consolidations will probably benefit them in getting some processes fixed in the places where they've already done this and then give them some best practices for what they can do going forward. So I think, again, you can let me know in the comments what you think. I think this is a great move from the post office. He said, There were ongoing reviews of operations at about 60 of 427 processing plants. In his letter, he promised not to move forward with further consolidation without advising Congress and then only at a moderated pace of implementation. So when they do restart this, it's going to slow from the pace with which he's been pursuing it to this point, which I think is also a good move. There had been mounting anger. The article continues in Congress about changes that USPS has said are necessary to cut projected financial losses. Some lawmakers have raised concerns about closing a processing center in one state and shifting process processing to another state. I think it was Wyoming that I saw that uh, was not going to have a processing center in the entire state. Um, now, granted, it's not a densely populated state, but the idea that you would have an entire state that did not have a, a state or regional processing facility seems aggressive, let's call it. (laughs) Uh, Last week, 26 senators in a letter led by Peters and also signed by Susan Collins, uh, Shelley Moore Capito, John Tester, and others urged United States Postal Service not to make irrevocable changes to its processing and delivery network. That is the other big concern. Once you've consolidated these facilities into a new one, you almost cannot undo that. You certainly cannot undo it cheaply. So if you're going to do it, it's got to work. It's got to be done right. And to this point, it seems as though it has not been, uh, shall we say, smooth. (laughs) Uh, This massive and complex evolution includes correcting for decades of haphazard decision-making and neglect to our physical infrastructure network, DeJoy said, adding that the Postal Service knows it must make improvements within the time limits we have for what he calls survival. The United States Postal Service in November reported a $6.5 billion yearly net loss as first-class mail fell to the lowest volume since 1968. That is a long time ago. It's not as long as I've been alive, but it's getting close. (laughs) Uh, Last month, the Postal Service said it wanted to raise the price of a first-class mail stamp to 73 cents, effective July 14th, the latest in a series of price hikes. They also said on Friday they're going to seek an average of a 25% price hike for high-volume shippers. Let's talk about that. (laughs) So this is probably good news for people like you and me because we're not high-volume shippers. So companies who do high-volume shipping have gotten huge discounts in the past. Those are essentially going away. This article is on Reuters. The Postal Service wants a 25% price hike for high-volume package shipping. They're seeking an average of 25% price increase for packages for regional delivery through its parcel select service, the price hike, which would take effect on July 14th and much still be approved by the Postal Regulatory Commission, but they almost always are, is because the United States Postal Service no longer intends to give incentives for parties to aggregate mail volume from multiple shippers and bring such volume directly to the destination delivery unit. They want to get rid of that discount for big shippers. That's all good as far as I'm concerned. That is going to be a way for them to claw back more money and make smaller sellers shipping charges and rates more competitive. I'm all about it. They also announced quietly that they are not proposing any price hikes for its USPS ground advantage package shipping shipping for July 14th. So we talked about a few weeks ago, the stamps are going up. Uh, Media mail rates are going up about 10%. They're taking a big jump, but USPS ground advantage is not going to have a price increase next month. I guess it's two months from now. So July 14th, 
that is going to make media mail highly uncompetitive in a lot of price brackets. So you'll definitely, if you're a media seller, you're definitely going to want to compare pricing between the new rates and what is going to be the existing rate for USPS Ground Advantage, because I think in many cases, Ground Advantage is now actually going to be cheaper. In theory, it is also a faster service. And of course, it includes $100 worth of insurance, which is also nice. So this is another potential big win for everyone involved. Uh, they do continue. They said they uh, plan to raise the price of those first class stamps. It's a 7.8% increase. Stamp prices, they note in this article, are up 36% since 2019. So uh, lots of things going on at the Postal Service. Most of them, for a change, appear to be fairly good news. We'll see how this whole thing shakes out with the consolidation process and if they're able to get this under control. The last couple of weeks for me have been pretty good after a run of a bunch of shipments that went missing or were delayed. Things seem to be a little bit back on track. You can let me know in the comments uh, how your experience is going with the post office. This is an interesting one. This is over on e-commerce bytes. And of course, as always, these will be linked in the show notes in the video description down below. Will brands advertise eBay? on clothing tags should apparel brands make it easier for their customers to sell their clothing on ebay when they're cleaning out their closets that's the pitch that ebay is making with its resell on ebay qr code that can be added to tags on everything from shirts to jackets ebay's head of fashion said the new resell feature helps brands keep their product out of the landfill quote while giving consumers an incredibly easy way to give their item a second life the graphic accompanying the announcement shows a tag that invites owners to check the authenticity of the product by using eBay's subsidiary uh, CERTA logo uh, with a URL and a code. There's no mention of eBay on the tag itself. The feature will be built into a CERTA logo secure by design digital ID, which will be accessible by scanning a connected product smart label. There is a link to the actual announcement, but what it essentially says is when a user scans the digital ID on a product smart label, a resell your garment button will be displayed on the item's digital profile. Once a user clicks on the button, they will be directed to check the authenticity of the item through Serta Logo's AI-based authentication system by signing in with their eBay account. Isn't that convenient? So if you don't have an eBay account, here's a way that they will get new users. Clever. When the authentication process is complete, an eBay listing will be pre-filled with information from the brand about the item, the user is then redirected to the listing page on eBay where they can fill in any missing fields or edit information already pre-filled before officially listing the item for sale on eBay. When eBay acquired CERTA logo last year, and we had talked about this, they were, quote, thrilled to officially welcome the CERTA logo team to eBay. Luxury fashion continues to be a key focus for us, and CERTA logo is a leading provider of AI-powered digital authentication that will allow us to deliver more trusted experiences with customers and their favorite designer brands. Looking forward to what's ahead. Well, now we know <laughs> one of the things that's ahead. Uh, CERTA logo founder and CEO uh, Michelle Kasucci referred to the QR code as a resell on eBay feature and said it was a natural next step for the company as there were already 540 million products connected to its secure digital IDs. That's huge. I had no idea it was that big an outfit. Being able to securely resell your products with ease only makes the circular shopping experience more accessible for everyone, resellers they note have already been using CERTA Logo's smart label feature to authenticate items, and some note the authenticity label in their descriptions when selling, say, Stone Island branded goods, as an example. So, I guess if I was Poshmark and ThreadUp, uh, this would be a shot across the bow, wouldn't it? Um, this could potentially lead to a lot of items ending up on ebay instead of on those sites so let me know in the comments um i i'd be curious what the brands think of this what the i guess what what what's what's in it for them i know they they all have these these goals they talk about wanting to be sustainable and all that sort of stuff so there's some let's just do good for the sake of doing good kind of thing here to get the products to be recycled and reused and so on but I wonder if there is a financial incentive involved. It really doesn't say anything here. Presumably, it says it will be up to companies who use Serta Logo to decide if they want to add the resell on eBay component to the smart label on their items. And it will be interesting to see, as the article says, which companies 
deem it worthy of their brand. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see a picture of what that tag looks like. So interesting, interesting stuff over there. Again, if you're Poshmark or Th ThreadUp or any of those uh, that really focus on clothing, this could be a problem for you. <laughs> Last bit of news, uh, Etsy buyers could get credits for refunds. This article also on e-commerce bites the beauty of the ePal eBay PayPal relationship before the 2015 breakup was that buyers and sellers could park funds in PayPal to apply towards future purchases, which to go back to Mercari was one of the reasons that they made all the changes that they made to the financial end of their system where you now have to pay a $2 fee to withdraw your own money. They want you to just leave your money there. They get to earn interest on it. There's a whole bunch of benefits for them to have all that extra cash on hand. So uh, that, whatever, good, good for Mercari uh, if they can pull it off. I've seen people really, really squawking about that. Again, I've, I've just gone to the point where I just don't take my money out until I've got a couple hundred bucks in there. So the, the percentage of that $2 fee is, ends up being fairly minuscule. But anyway, continuing on, that option no longer exists on eBay and Etsy now that those marketplaces, of course, have taken over their payment processing. Etsy seems to recognize the synergy that comes from having users being able to park their funds on their account, and they are testing a new option to give buyers the option of requesting their refunds via an Etsy credit. In an announcement last Wednesday, they said, we're experimenting with a new way for buyers to get an immediate refund for their purchase in the form of Etsy credit they can put toward their next order. With Etsy credit, buyers can shop for something sooner. This doesn't change anything in your workflow. You'll process refunds the same way you do today. So the money essentially will come out of your account and then go to Etsy where, and then they will then issue your buyer uh, an Etsy store credit. Uh, this article asks, as experienced sellers, what advice would you give to Etsy on changes to benefit your sales? Do you see any downsides to the new feature? I'm not gonna read the comments that were attached to this because <laughs> Uh, to say folks were not in favor of this was would be, uh, let's call it an understatement. Uh, but I don't, I guess I don't really see any problem with it. If you're having to give a refund, whether it goes to the, the buyer in cash or in the form of an Etsy credit, ultimately doesn't make any difference. The money's still going to come out of your account the same either way. So there you go. That is going to wrap up uh, this week's reselling news. Please feel free to comment uh, with anything that you think on any of those news items. As always, if you're getting something from this and you're watching on YouTube, please do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button so that YouTube knows this was a good use of your time and mine. With that, let's get into this What Sold. So it was a, a fairly good week last week. Um, I don't, I'm actually recording this this week on Friday night, so I don't have the full week's totals yet because I haven't finalized Friday night's business, but it, it's been pretty decent. Uh, I've got maybe eight or 10 items here to share with you this week. This is a DVD, a Blu-ray, rather, Shameless, the complete ninth season, a four-disc set. This was something I picked up at a library sale, gosh, maybe a year and a half ago. I've had this for quite a while. I had it listed, I think, originally at $29.99. It was on sale. I had a customer reach out and ask what my best price was. I sent them an offer of 22 bucks. I'm in it for $2, so Shameless Season 9, complete four-disc set, $2 in the 22 bucks plus shipping over on eBay. This was a neat old book from 1948, the Medal of Honor official publication of the Department of the Army, a hardcover with essentially a list and photos of all the recipients of the Medal of Honor for the United States Army. I had picked this up at an estate sale a long, long time ago for a couple of bucks. It was in a promotion running for $31.49. It got a watcher. I sent out an offer and it sold for $28.34 plus shipping. This was a big book, uh, probably 14 by seven or eight by two or three inches thick, massive, massive hardcover book. This actually went out in a box because it was so big, $28.34 plus shipping. Uh, another item from eBay, Old German Baptist in Civilian Public Service from 1941 to 1947. This was a 1989 paperback written by a guy named John Brubaker. 
This was part of a big lot of books that I own for about 50 cents a piece. This was part of my 25% off clearance that I'm running. So this has been in my inventory for a while. If you were here for that live a couple of weeks ago when I created my clearance sale, this is one of those things. Sold ultimately for $29.99 plus media mail shipping. Over to Etsy. Uh, I talked about her last week. This is another of those Gwen Frostic books, uh, Ruminate, Thoughts, and Block Prints. Uh, this was by Presscraft Papers, first edition hardcover from 1997. This one's a lot more recent than some of the other ones that I had. Really neat book with a lot of great artwork and great poetry. Picked up as part of the big thousand book lot that I did about a month ago. So I'm in this for 50 cents. This sold on Mercari for $39.99 plus media mail shipping. Back over to eBay, Modern Refrigeration Practice by Guy R. King from 1971. McGraw-Hill Illustrated Hardcover. Nice big, essentially a textbook on how to fix refrigerators from the 1970s. I talk about these kind of books pretty regularly here. Old kind of technical manuals and textbooks for appliance repair or machinists, anything like that. I generally, if I see them, I'll look them up. In a lot of cases at this point, I'll just buy them because <laughs> I know they're going to be good. Uh, this was one that was sold uh, over on eBay for $49.99. This was something I picked up at a garage sale, oh man, probably about a year ago, not quite a year ago now, uh, for like a seventy, something like that. It was a really cool sale with a lot of old stuff like this. So modern refrigeration practice from 1971. You just never know. Further poems of Emily Dickinson from 1929. This was published by Little Brown and Company, a hardcover X library edition in really not very good condition, but there's not a lot of these out there from that particular era. So this is one that I picked up at a estate sale a couple of weeks ago for less than 90 cents. This sold on eBay for $59.99 plus, again, media mail shipping. That was a sale where I've, I mentioned several times I bought 167 books for 150 bucks. I am way, way, way into the money already uh, on, that, on that deal. That has just been a terrific uh trip to the donut shop <laughs> is what it amounted to. That was the one I talked about a few weeks ago. I was on my way to get donuts and I saw the sign. I was like, ah, I'll go check it out. And man, it, I'm glad I did. Uh, another book over on eBay, The Book of Botanical Prints, The Complete Plates by Tacken from Barnes and Noble hardcover with its dust jacket. I picked this up at an estate sale about four months ago for $2. This sold for $59.99. Uh, here's one. I've talked about these, um, seventh day Adventist tracks that I picked up for less than 10 cents a piece at a sale several months ago. And I continue to sell these here and there one or two at a time. Uh, this person bought a bunch of these from me several weeks ago and placed a second order. This is a repeat buyer who has bought six more of these tracks. These were all written by JL Tucker. I don't have photos of all of them, but if you find these, the quiet hour radio and quiet TV and any of those, and you can get them cheap, man, pick them up because they're, they are worth 10, 12, 15, $18 a piece. This guy bought six of them totaling $77 and 94 cents plus shipping. This was one that because I had the combined shipping set up, uh, it correctly calculated the shipping. So the customer was able to make one purchase and pay the right amount of shipping. If you didn't catch my live, on Wednesday, go back and take a look at that uh, because I, I kind of walk you through some of the basics of setting up for combined shipping. And here's your flip of the week. Uh, these I picked up at an estate sale as part of a pretty big purchase. I'm into these for a buck a piece. This is a two book set. So $2, The Secret Doctrine, volumes one and two by a guy named H. P. Blavatsky. Never heard of him, never heard of this work, but when I comped it at the sale, it looked like a good one. Uh, 1974 unabridged verbatim edition. There are multiple different editions of this set out there. But if you see this thing, the secret doctrine, especially if you can get both volumes and they're going to be a buck or two or three a piece, I would recommend that you grab them. This was two books for two bucks and sold for $89.99 plus shipping over on eBay. So all in all, a good week. Some really interesting stuff that got out of here. Very productive week. I'm going to be at 
probably by the time everything is said and done tomorrow, 110 listings listed and probably something in the 80s, maybe the low 90s sold. I did have several purchases this week that were multiple items, which is always good. So let me know in the comments below how your week has been, if you had any particularly fantastic sales. Um, but it's continued to be pretty good here over at the Galaxy. With that, as always, I want to thank you for spending a little bit of your time with me. Remember the new show schedule. Um, we're going to do this show. It will be available for members over the weekend and then go live for everyone on Monday. Wednesdays at 11 a.m. I will be going live this week's episode. I'm going to be covering book terminology, um, kind of all the technical terms that you might see on a book listing, and I'll discuss why. I choose to or not to use some of them depending on the book or where I'm listing it. So if you're interested in book terminology and you want to know, you care about what my opinion <laughs> uh, of some of those terms are that we'll be doing that Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And then every Friday, my new series, The um, Messages from the Past with readings from old postcards and yearbooks that goes up on Fridays. That is usually going to be available for members on YouTube on Wednesday. And that is going to put a wrap on this week's episode. I hope everybody is having a great week. I hope you had a wonderful weekend and you're back to work this morning, Monday morning for you when you hear this or watch this, whichever the case may be. And as always, if you enjoyed this or got something out of it, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up button. If you're not currently a subscriber to the channel or a follower of the podcast, please consider doing that as well. I would very much appreciate it. Until next time, my friends. It's time to sell. Thanks, guys. You have been listening to the Galaxy CD's Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will catch you again next time.